Hi, I'm Andre J, and today we are going to do a mock pre-recorded staged version of this Introduction to Analog Signals class that uh, I've been helping out with here at FaceSpace for I guess like four or five years now. Um, there has been a lot of demand that people have expressed to me over the years of doing this as an online class. And my response is always, that's a really stupid idea because it involves all of this crap. And I cannot teleport these things to your house in order for you to learn how to use them. Uh, 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 so it seemed like, at a certain point though, it seemed like there should be something for people who cannot physically make it here, which is one reason why, one, I'm going to travel around the country and do stuff like this for the next couple of years. And two, we have these amazing resources and amazing people to work with in order to try to like make this sort of like mockumentary version of the class. So that's a little bit of why we're doing this. Um, another huge reason of why we're doing this is more so than teaching you like as a student like what uh, how to like work with analog video signals is how could you put together a class like this? Because in one way of thinking like they're pretty simple. Not necessarily easy, it's very simple though. You just plug a bunch of things in together, make it really hard for like people to fuck it up and like let everyone have a good time. Uh, it's not to say that it doesn't involve a lot of work and effort, but the, the entire process I want to show to people how we do things here in the interest that more people would take it upon themselves to do this kind of stuff in your own town and not just have to be like, oh shit, you come here and do this for me. Like, you can do this too. It's really not that hard. Um, and yeah, that's a big part about what this video is about. Um, so yeah, the first thing we do in these classes, which is possibly one of the most important things we do, is we always go around Robin and everyone will introduce themselves. You tell your name, you give a little bit of information about what is your background that brought you here, like what kind of an artist you are, or what kind of engineering you study, or did you work as a grip or something. Um, and then you say, what are your goals for this? And I'll start off with this. And I'm Andre. My background is uh, I've been doing video art like this for like, I guess, 10 years now. Um, and my goals are that teaching things is really, uh, 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 it's one of the more interesting things I've done for like a form of income in the last five years. I like it because it keeps me honest. Um, I can't really, you can't really bullshit about what you're doing if you have to like tell it to people all the time. Um, so if you can't explain something, you don't really know what you're doing. You can't show someone else how to do it, you don't really know what you're doing. Um, and it's a socially fun thing to do. And there was one more, but I forgot, so we'll just move on. <laughs> uh, well, hi, I'm Violin, and um, well, actually, uh, I do a PhD about um, feedback from uh, cybernetics to AI, but just for video art. And so my goal here is like I really came from France just because I want to practice video feedback and not just understand it in a very theoretical way. So that's how I found Andre online and I really wanted to get my hand in the dust a little bit and really understand and have a better sense for myself of what it means to do video feedback and how you control and not control it and things like that. Cool. Awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Nicholas. Um, I have, I guess, a general background in crewing and assisting for different forms of media, going back to like my high school. Um, but really, I like to think of myself as an artist and I try to make work involved with image making in some way, shape or form, whether it's a still image in photography or a moving image through um, film, video or video art. Oh yeah, cool. Hi, I'm Emma. Um, I'm also like an artist, I guess I have a background in writing and performing. And so I found video art when I started to get into film. Um, and I really, well, with analog systems, I was really into the idea that it's live because I had a theater background. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just like it a lot. I feel like <laughs> I've been interested in learning more stuff about it and doing it for like, also maybe like four years now. Um, and then found face space because there's not that many people who do it in the general, but in New York as well. And my goal for today is um, honestly to have fun. Haven't done 
this in a while. And then also, like, I really like the idea of other people being able to watch it and get something out of it. Because I feel like I came to Face Space being like, I know just kind of the conceptual idea of doing this. I've never done it before. So I think it's a cool thing to share with people that is really, like, achievable. So I'm excited about, like, helping, hypothetically, other people learn how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're probably just helping AI. Yeah, point. exactly. <laughs> just fucking fodder for another. <laughs> um, awesome. Jonathan? Hi, I'm Jonathan. Um, I'm the camera person today, or one of two camera people today. Um, I'm a visual artist. I've been making um, work primarily focused on geometric abstraction for, oh boy, about 14 years now. And I became really interested in, in video work and video feedback in the last couple of years. Um, I'm really fascinated with the incredible amount of extremely powerful tools that existed uh, for very specific ends in terms of production and making film and engaging in cinema and TV. And then I'm really fascinated with all of that power and what you can do to shift it and change it and, and kind of rework it into interesting ways. Um, but yeah, that's why I'm here and happy to be here. Awesome. Hunter? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Hunter. The camera's going to just, this one's going to be pointing forward. I guess I, hold on. Can I do this? Will I do it? Will I do it? No, it won't flip around. <laughs> oh, it, oh, it's doing it! It's doing it! Oh, oh, okay. Um, so this will be a great P and P because it's just your mouth right now. <laughs> Keep going. Um, and then, uh, so I found out about Face Space like uh, three or four years ago. Um, before then, I had a background in film and video, doing audio stuff. And uh, little did I know, uh, years and years later, I'd be just combining the same shit, but in very interesting ways. Um, and uh, I feel really lucky that I found Face Space and that um, there is a resource out there for other people who wanted to do this and learn more about it. Um, and then I got involved with teaching here, and I think teaching is really important, keeping it alive. And uh, it'll be a good time. This will be a fun class. I'm happy to record it, and that's uh, the goal. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, that's basically the kind of thing we open up our classes with, all the classes, not just this one, but I think that's one of the most important things we do here is try to build a community um, because, you know, it's, 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 that's one of the stealth goals of Phase Space all along has been to try to promote the idea of working together and building community ties as opposed to just like putting together something to like make money because it's more fun that way and it's actually much more helpful uh, 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 in the long run for everyone. Cameras and monitors. So how do we generate signals and have fun with just a very simple setup of take a camera and then plug the output into a monitor? Um, so, what we do in these classes is we set everyone up in pairs or little groups so they can work together. And for this cameras and monitors section, what I say is one person should play with the camera. And that usually involves zooming, adjusting up. This camera is nice because we have the gimbal head. And we can do some rotations. And then for stations like this especially, I say other people should get in there and we'll get some physical things in the way. So we've got you put your hands in there, uh, we can grab some weird glass things, and that's how it's up. Here, I'm going to do some glass. Whoa. Yeah, so try holding that up and then slowly zoom in. We'll get some weird, yeah, strange tropical fish patterns. But yeah, so Nicholas, what do you notice about like what happens when you control the camera? You're really just doing little positional things yeah. and rotating and zooming. Well, it's funny when it's zoomed in like this, it looks like just like a tunnel almost. And I'm like, how does it do that? And then zooming out, I realize, oh no, it's just literally the feedback the camera pointed at the monitor and then um, I don't know it's just in incredible how like it can transform into something so abstract so strange when it's really just a simple process yeah 
Yeah, and then how about what can you do when you're not controlling the camera? There's still a fair amount of performability in this kind of a setup. Um, Via Lane was playing with the glass thing. So if you hold the glass right up to that, tell me what sort of things you notice as you move it back and forth, in and out. Well, it completely transformed the, the image, but I'm still like really trying to understand how much control we can have on feedback. Like, okay, if we don't move the camera, we can still recognize the original setup. I mean, if we if you zoom out, we're going to see the monitor. But still, like even doing this with the reflection of lights, it's changing a lot. Yeah, just a simple interruption, like, like, so the thing to notice about, or the thing to keep in the back of your head when you're trying to think about control and feedback is, this is happening 60 times a second, so every tiny thing you do will have very, very large repercussions that are happening far outside of your general, like, liminal zone. Like, it's, it's imperceptible. We will move over and show some more perceptible stuff at some point here. But that's sort of, I think, where a lot of the sort of feelings of, like, you are controlling things, sort of. You're steering things. It's like steering a boat. Uh, but when you steer a boat, you paddle, and then one minute later, the actual effect of that paddling steering comes into effect. Um, and then Emma, if you put your hand on the screen and keep zoomed out like that, so put your hand there and then just whip it out real quick. So what do you notice what's happening with the sort of like, I don't know, reflections or echoes of your handprint? Well, I mean, it's interesting you talking about it being 60 frames per second also, because I think even I just did it twice, you still see motion further down the feedback that the hand is still affecting it. Um, so I guess it's just a good example of like the kind of ripple effect that you're saying that like the more you manipulate it without the camera, the more you realize that as much as you have control, you're more of affecting things that it's already doing rather than like changing what it's doing. Yeah, it's kind of, it's a bit more like you're not gardening so much as you are like an arbor reader <laughs> in terms of like the tree's going to grow anyway, but you can prune it and you can like adjust how it grows. But it's a process which already happens on its own. And we are just sort of here, sort of like you can steer it, you can guide it. But, um, but another neat thing to notice is we can count. So I said 60 frames a second earlier. That's how fast the processing is happening. But when you put your hand in there, yeah. whip it out, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's like a total of like six seconds for it to reverberate all the way down there. Yeah. Does anyone have any idea why it's taking that long to go down the, 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 the Black Lodge here? I mean, the only thing that I can think of is like every square that we see is kind of just like the laser, I don't know, because it's pointed, the camera's pointed at the monitor and the monitor is showing like the image on the camera, whenever like you do something in front of the camera, that signal or that motion, whatever it is, takes a bit longer to travel further down um, the, I don't know, tunnel or like, <laughs> uh -huh. just like the different um, screens. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, what's happening is, so there's a little bit of, um, so this is doing things very quickly. The camera processor does things very quickly. The TV itself, it's showing a new frame every 60 seconds. But somewhere in between here, as we follow from this cable all the way to the screen, there's a weird thing that happens because you can see this is a digital monitor. This is an LCD TV. Um, and when you plug an analog signal into a digital monitor, it has to take more, like a little bit of time in order to, t to, to process the analog information, tear it apart, turn it into bits, and turn that into discrete little pixels we can see on the screen. So there's still speed happening inside of here, speed happening inside of here, but there's a little bottleneck that happens right when the cable goes in where we get a delay. And that's that echo right there where we can let uh, 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 patterns reverberate down which gives us a little bit more controllability and stability 
uh, at the expense of uh, uh, other stuff that we'll see when we start working with uh, tube monitors. All right, so I think that's this station. And we're gonna try to move over to the next station and see if this is something we can actually do live. <laughs> We got some glitch art starting out here. Okay, now we're back. Ah. So, this station is, and I shouldn't be standing here. <laughs> so, what do y'all notice about this station being different from the last one we were just at? Colors? Yeah, there's a lot more color here. The way it's the lines are kind of moving throughout, like there, you could tell it's just like I don't know, m like multiple versions of the same image. Whereas mm -hmm. here, I mean, I'm still like not really sure what I'm exactly looking at. Well, it's a different texture. Yeah, it's 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 like brain corals coming out from like a little focal point as opposed to that sort of hall of mirrors thing. Yeah. Also, I guess there's two different kinds of monitors being used as well that it looks like it's another LCD monitor and then an older one that instead of just the camera and the monitor this is also going to another monitor as well yeah we have this is a setup I really like to have for any of these classes is it allows you to um, it allows you to see the difference between how a, a signal looks on an LCD TV versus a CRT because this is the exact same signal running through both TVs, these old broadcast PVMs. You can do a pass-through on them. Really, really handy for this kind of thing. And you can, if Jonathan, Jonathan's focusing on the, the CRT right now, and you can see there's certain colors on there. If you move over and look at the LCD, and there's some sort of magical glitch that happens every <laughs> three minutes, which is really beautiful. Um, uh, 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 we see that there's just uh, 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 a lot of things about the color depth. The brightness going from dark to white is going to be way different on both monitors and just how the colors look. You get this sort of murky stepped color in here that doesn't really exist in here. So that's a fun one. Another neat thing about this setup too, so if Emma, take the monitor and rotate it. So you notice that we don't have a gimbal head here. Jonathan, if you want to look up a second here. We've got is just using one of these magic arms to mount a security cam pointed straight down. And this way, when you have a monitor like this, we can do rotational stuff and we don't need to have a, a, a super large bulky um, thing on the, the, the camera to play around with it. Um, yeah, anything else we notice different about this setup? Do you want to try zooming in on the camera a little bit and see how zoomed can we get? I guess this is as zoomed. Oh, wait. As zoomed as we can get. Manual zoom. Yeah, manual zoom. <laughs> oh, wow. And yeah, do we notice anything else about like the texture of the feedback, yeah. the speed of the feedback? I mean, the fact that it's not black and white is interesting, I think. At least on the... There's like a spiral, a slight spiral pattern that emerged when you um, brought it closer to the camera. Yeah, yeah. We do this just right. We can get some spirals going on here. I if I don't mess up the, um, the cables while I'm doing it. Here we go, here we go. Yeah. So we can get these sort of spirals, and the spirals are happening in the color space. They're not really happening in the brightness, the luminosity. It's just sort of like color-based spiraling. So you can get patterns that are just in hue as opposed to patterns in black and white. So that's something nifty about this one. And then how about if we you know, try focusing? That's the one on the end there. Let's focus in until we start to get a couple of those, um, some more kind of like uh, uh, lines coming in there. Yeah, like that. So, the Elaine, if you take a look at the CRT here, and then compare it to the kind of uh, feedback we saw in the last one, do you notice anything different about what's going on with the patterns? Well, I mean, like, we have a circular pattern that we didn't not 
I mean, we didn't have in the first one, it was more like a spiral with the original setup, like still um, graspable with the monitor. Here, I mean, like it looks pretty cellular, so I don't even know where the patterns come from, except that you zoom in. So. Yeah, where do you think the patterns are coming from? No so it is cellular, right? It looks like cellular yeah. automata or like undersea coral growth or something. It really does. Yeah, you get in here and you've got these different levels. You start right in the middle and you can see the sort of like, um, maybe like a sunflower or one of those Fibonacci um, plant patterns. And then as it radiates outward, and this is great because when you start with this, it will sort of like either build up or give it a little kick. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now we're getting there. Now let's bring. So where do those dots come from? Where do those dots come from? Does anyone have a guess? Is it just like a, a decomposition of like the image somehow? Yes. That is one way to think about it. We think about maybe not decomposition, but like photocopies, making copies of copies of copies. Oh, right. There's artifacting that happens every time. So really, if you wanted to be really pathological, get a color copier or a color scanner or something, and just take an image, any image, scan it, print it out, scan it again, print it out, scan it again, do that about 300 times, Every time you do that, you'll notice that there's like a little bit of artifacting that comes in because your scanner has a grid of sensors and your um, printer has a grid that it prints on. So wh what that means in here is that our camera sensor here, this is a little security cam. These ones have CMOS sensors, which all sen camera sensors are kind of gritty, but the CMOS sensors are the most grittish of all gritty sensors. Um, and they're also gritty with two T's. So they're <laughs> gritty and gritty. Um, meaning that we're going to get these kind of like, these little cellular patterns that are happening here as an artifacting of just like the sensor is doing its best to see what's going on there, but it's going to have to kind of clump things all into squares. And that's where you get these little edges. That's where you get these little like dots in the middle. And just happening over and over again is how we get these kind of cellular patterns. Does that make sense? All right, awesome. Let's move to the next station. Right. Emma, do you want to operate the camera? Nicholas and Violaine, yeah. do you want to sort of interfere with the signal a bit? you off here a second. I give you this. And let me give you. Another thing we do here is we're not just focused on the video signal stuff. I wonder where my orb is at. Shit. Um, we also try to show people that there's a lot of like physical things you can do that don't really require any equipment. Another big goal I have for these kind of classes is to not just be like a lot of people come to these classes and they say, Andre, what should I buy? Give me a shopping list. And I'm just like, that's not the point here. Like, this isn't, the, 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 the goal here shouldn't just be like, figure out things you can buy. But how I got into a lot of this was by digging through the trash and <laughs> finding weird shit on the street and being like, well, I think I could fix this up and do something interesting with it. Um, and honestly, like a large proportion of the vase space gear was found on the street or in the trash, so. <laughs> um, but using just like random pieces of glass and like stuff I took out of broken projectors or cameras uh, 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 can be a lot of fun and make much of a larger difference to your performance and getting started and stuff than just saying, here, buy this mixer, buy this camera, buy this TV. Uh, the interesting thing about these sort of things is that there's, excuse me, <laughs> is that there's not just like one size fits all solution to anything. And there's not even like if you bought, if I gave you the model number of this camera, the model number of that TV, 
the ones you buy are going to be different because this is fucking analog technology and it all degrades in like unique ways. So, okay, that was a rant. Um, <laughs> how does so? What do y'all notice about the feedback here? About how does it move? How does it feel? How does it taste? It's a lot faster. It's a lot faster, right? It how about the blobby. shapes? It looks more blobby. Yeah, yeah, it's fast and blobby. So, does anyone have any guesses on why it's fast and blobby? So, is it because it's a CRT um, monitor? Yeah, yeah, that's one part of it. So, if Jonathan you can go out and you can see there's a giant ass on that TV. That's a CRT. <laughs> that's got a fucking badonka donk. <laughs> um, it's thick. And then, come on over here and get a little closer with the camera. The camera's not that big. Uh, but what do you know about this camera, too? You mean with my loaded questions. <laughs> I would say it's older than both of the other cameras. Yeah, it's definitely got that flavor, right? You can see the, at the very least the fonts will let you know, if nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, so this is the oldest kind of consumer video camera you can get. It's not really that old. It's from like the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, but this is has a tube sensor. Um, during the classes, depending on how many engineering students are involved, I will go into more detail about sensors, tube sensors, transistors, have a big rant about all that shit. I'm not going to do that here. What we're going to say, but I'm going to just mention that so you can research that on your own if you want. <clears throat> just going to say tubes are fast. Tubes are hot and fast. And you don't really get a chance to do that sort of like stick your hand and it just immediately, it's instantaneously, it's not quite moving at the speed of the light, but it might as well be from our perspective. And then how about texture wise? Why do you think this would be blobbier than the other ones we were working with? I think Maybe part of it is the exposure ISO of the camera is just like it doesn't pick up as much light as the other ones And so the light is more concentrated in the middle, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a little bit of it the, well, the lens itself and the way it senses light is fundamentally way different yeah. than the other cameras uh, 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 There's this weird way too much detail for this, but there's a weird way that um Tube sensors work with light, involves signal feedback within the tube sensor itself. So if we, one thing I like to show people, can you see this on the screen, Jonathan? You should never do this with your cameras at home. <laughs> um, I ruined so many camera sensors by doing this, but point it at a light and move it around and you see there's trails already. There's no, yeah. there's no video feedback happening here, but there's sensor-based feedback happening. Um, so that sort of adds to that sort of blobby texture is that whenever you give it a bright source of light, it's going to be like, I like that. I'm going to hold on to that for a little bit longer than really feels uh, uh, like a good idea. Also, when people used to use these for shooting out on the street, you had to be very, very careful about not pointing it at the sun. You know what happens if you point a tube camera at the sun? It like explodes? Yeah, it fucking explodes. There's a vacuum in there. <laughs> it's also a, a very small safety concern. It's a good one to throw in there too. When you move tube, cam tube TVs around, do not hold a t TV to your chest like this. Lift it and move it. Because if the tube cracks at all, the vacuum will fucking, and the glass will break and it'll like, suck your guts out. Oh my gosh. Jesus. I think that's how it goes, right? <laughs> the vacuum goes whoop, and it will suck your guts out into the TV. So don't do that. So how do you pick it up? <laughs> Just pick it up the other way. Yeah. Amazing out. <laughs> that way if you fall it'll suck someone else's guts out. Okay. okay. Wait a minute, it doesn't mean like, okay, just to get back to <laughs> how fast this one works. I mean, do like, you mean like if we change the camera, it's what creates uh, the slight delay we had in the first station? The camera did not create the delay there. Well, the camera created a little bit of delay yeah, there. Was, uh, Most of it was the screen, though. Yeah. That's the analog to digital conversion always takes more time than you think. And so if we don't have it here or we don't sense it as much, it's because we're CTR all the way. 
because both of these are analog. Okay. Analog sensor, analog CRT means everything gets to work at the speed of electricity, which is almost speed of light. But then is that why it's blobby too? Or yeah, the blobbiness is a little bit of that, just because it's it's there's no delay. A little bit of delay is what gives these patterns a chance to form. And the faster it moves, the more it's just going to be like, oh, I like the blobs. Yeah. But also the sensor itself, it's less of a grid. The, the one over there is very gritty and gritty, a lot of noise, a lot of squares. This sensor is smooth and blobby. Mm -hmm. And if we just like zoom back, um, zoom out, like just to see the primary setup. Yeah, okay, we still see the mise en abyme, but we're not gonna have like a much. That's much okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I just wanted to. And also, you can see like how much worse the light sensor is in oh, this yeah. camera. With okay, we don't that. have. Yeah, it's totally skewed to green. Yeah. It leans real heavy on green, and this isn't. Not all tube sensors are do the same thing because you could have a three tube camera sensor, and that's where you have an individual tube that senses red, green, and blue, or you could have individual tubes that sense luma, PB, and PR. Those will have not amazing quality, but if you look at if you look at television from the '70s, they were all filmed with three tube cameras. You can mm -hmm. see exactly what the sort of like uh, uh, quality loss is, and to a certain extent, you just get used to it and you say, "Oh, that's just what video looks like." Uh, but it's fun if you're a video artist and you fuck around with different sensors for a while, and then you start watching like old TV, and you're just like. Whoa, there's like a bunch of ringing feedback in the, the in Monty Python or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, are there any other questions about this specific setup? People usually love or hate this kind of thing. When they do the boot camps and stuff, a lot of people are just like, I don't want this. <laughs> don't let me touch this. I feel like it's also interesting because it's like, with this camera, it feels like, the controls are a little less precise than a newer one also, so I understand why it would be frustrating being like, what am I even doing? Like, I feel like because it moves so fast, it's harder to see your direct effect on it. Yeah, and it can be a lot more frustrating when you're getting started because you're just kind of like, oh, let me do something. Yeah, and then it Gone. Goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's just something to keep an eye out for. It doesn't have to be like that, but it's going to be a little bit more of you got to be more patient because the camera is less patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, what do you think about two cameras, Vila? About this camera? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm very, uh, it's a little like you said, like I'm very conscious it's video right now. It's just like I'm trying to imagine, yeah, I suppose that's like what you would do if you had a camera in the early 80s and doing it <laughs> at home. I can. Yeah, I can see that because it really feels like somehow not low definition, but a bit, little bit of that. It just like feels like not as good quality as like the first two stations, but mm -hmm. it also looks way more sensitive. So it's actually exciting, but I feel like that's probably really hard to control and track with. I mean, you have to be probably a little slow with the camera. I don't know. It feels like it's... Mm -hmm. It's like trying Pretty to tame like a you. wild stallion. Yeah. You have to be gentle, you have to whisper in there. Yeah, yeah, it feels like that. not be too loud, no sudden movements. Mm. But, but sometimes I'm wondering, like, if you turn it around, are we going to get, like, you know, oh, circular so patterns? Or, it's another thing that two cameras are really good for yeah. um, is the kind of um, oh, wow. okay. spiraling and radial patterns you can get. Well, that does look like a video they're quite really uh, exceptional for this. Oh, okay. And a lot of views will be familiar with, uh, what's the one called? Space time. Space time dynamics and video feedback, I think. Yeah, that was Crutch all field. done using uh, uh, tube cams. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Sandian image processor. <laughs> but yeah, so that is tube cams. Video processors. What can you do with a video signal that adds another little thing in the chain that's more than just cameras, monitors, sticking your hands in there, whatnot, but isn't a full-fledged video mixer? Turns out there's not really a lot from a technical standpoint. You can do it to a video signal, um, but what little you can do 
has a lot of fun repercussions in the feedback world. So we're going to start exploring video processors. These are also called enhancers um, for some marketing reasons. Um, does everyone feel like this is an enhanced signal right now? How enhanced does this feel, Jonathan? It feels like it's, yeah, you mean in like the classic Blade Runner, like uh, <laughs> play? Yeah. Enhanced edition. That, that's right. Yeah. So it's certainly, it's certainly modified. So what do we think enhanced means? Just I, like a guess. Um, well, I mean, I noticed the first thing I noticed was that it's different colors than the last time we used it. So yeah, I assume you can- Yeah, more color depth here. Yeah, I Sorry. assume you can mess, no, no, just that you can mess with the colors and that usually, I mean, I'm an editor. I think about enhancing video as like correcting the shot and stuff. So I'm going to assume that involves sharpening as well and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It's what you can do in real time without dumping the signal to some other sort of processing thing that you can do to hopefully make it a better signal because the NTSC video signal, CVBS video signals, they're really kind of like black magic miracle of like how can it even look this good given the constrictions and restrictions that it has. Um, uh, Vio Lane, what does what do you notice that's happening different now that we've got a video processor in the mix? Well, I mean, like it's more saturated as far as the colors. I mean, I said that I said that already, but so I would say yeah, saturation, and also there is one switch when you use it. Um, it looks like we could go back to black and white, perhaps. So maybe brightness. Like yeah, right now it looks really black and white, and. Um, yeah, and then let, let's hang out, so bring that brightness back to the notch, and let's hang out on color for a second. So, bring it up, turn the color all the way up. And let's mess around with that tint a second. There we go, hold it right there. And now grab that color, and start to twist it down. Start to turn the color down, and everyone, uh, Viola, and tell me what you see happening here, in terms of behavior. So it looks more blobby again, but we're not keeping the camera, so that's not it. But I mean, I see, I see like the full red, blue, green of, um, I guess, analog video. Yeah, we're getting the full analog video rainbow. Yeah. <laughs> not a full um, rainbow. Full no, analog video the rainbow. Analog one, yeah, <laughs> RBD. And uh, other than that, but yeah, depending where it turns out, like we may get just the blue or... I mean, just one of those three colors, but I noticed it's strobing a bit too when... Yeah. yeah, we're getting some pulsating, some strobing happening here. Do you want to try moving the camera around a little bit? Do you think mm -hmm. maybe... Is the strobing going to happen all the time, or is it just when the camera is in a certain position? Let's see. So we have a little bit of control over this strobing. We're going to get it when the camera is more centered and we have more feedback in the frame. Oh, so I'm and seeing. And to zoom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we zoom. get more of that pulsing coming in. Because this is it zooming out. Yeah, and it's pretty stable. And then this is it zooming in. It starts to get kind of creepy. Yeah. So the color, as we turn up and down saturation, we can't really help but affect the brightness. We can't help but affect everything else about the signal too. Um, so the more sort of like blobby color we have going on, that's going to affect the total brightness. And at a certain point, it's going to like strobe out and blow out the screen. Um, let's talk about filtering for a second. So uh, what's another way we can enhance? You mentioned this earlier, Emma. How can we enhance a video signal? Um, you can sharpen it, which I think um, is essentially like, I mean, at least in when I do it, it's like artificially like removing some of the grain from it. So like that's one thing that you can do besides coloring it, which I guess is kind of we were messing with the saturation color before. Mm -hmm. um, other stuff. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, hold it right here. So hold the camera right here. Yeah. And then Jonathan. Let's mm -hmm. turn up the high pass filter. Let's turn up this enhance. And what do we notice happening? Well, we've got more artifacts. 
Yeah, we've got more artifacts. Uh, it's what I call worms. So if we, if, if we can see a little closer, it looks like a bunch of worms sort of all swimming together in the same uh, worm swimming pool. And uh, 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 this is a direct result of sharpening. Yeah. Um, so even if, this is a question I get asked a lot, is how do you get these sort of complex reaction diffusion patterns? Because people are like, oh, I just tried with my camera and my monitor at home, and all I got was like some like ovals. Um, is, is the, the camera trying to, or rather the processor, is it, is it trying to find um, outlines by increasing the contrast of like nearby colors, or is it something so else? So it can't completed? actually do, it cannot, so what you cannot do with an analog signal without digitizing it is affect anything other than one part of the signal at a time. Mm. So the signal is coming through linearly. So if we think about it in terms of, I'm gonna fuck up a shot here. Um, like think about this, chop this up into a grid and think of each of these pixels as being just like one single unit. We can only affect one of these at a time. This mm. is linearly being passed through like that, 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 mm -hmm. that. Um, so this pixel has no idea what that pixel or that pixel is doing. Gotcha. And I'm saying pixel even though it's analog because we still think about video as being pixels even in this realm. So we're doing something else other than that, uh, which does have the effect of boosting contrast. Uh, we are running a high pass filter on the signal. And does anyone have a guess? So everyone probably, if you've played with synthesizers, DJ shits, any kind of like DAW before, probably have like a decent intuitive idea of what a high pass filter does. It brings out the low end of music, the low end of sound, kick drums, bass, and shit like that. What is low end in an image? What does filtering out low frequencies in an image mean? It's weird, right? <laughs> Non-intuitive. Hmm. Yeah, this is one to ponder. <laughs> <laughs> I can make guesses, but I'm pretty sure. Please make a guess. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, give me some guesses. Well, I mean, so the, the signal is made up of color information, but it's also made up of brightness. Um, yeah, so... I yeah, mean, continually maybe... varying brightness. Yeah. So the brightness is analog, and it's continually varying, meaning we... Um, We've got like something dark here and it's low, and then there's something bright here and it goes high. So, loosely speaking, if you have high frequencies, you've got a wave shape that's like this. And if you've got low frequencies, you've got a wave shape that's like this. So if we remove wave shapes that go like this and increase the amount of wave shapes that go like this, what does that mean for an image? We've got sharper contrast between dark stuff and bright stuff. We're bringing out, we're, we're, we're removing anything that's blurry. We're removing anything that's similar to one another. And we're artificially stimulating the creation of these high frequency. When you see we've got sharp edges on everything, that's high frequency video information. This is a very low frequency video information. And when I stick my finger in there and start interacting with things, we get higher frequency video stuff. Mm. So yeah, it's a weird one. If you don't understand it at first, don't sweat it. It doesn't really matter. It only really matters if you're interested in like circuit bending and designing your own gear. But I think it's important to communicate this information because the circuitry involved in video processors, it's not complicated. It can mostly be done without any microchips involved whatsoever. You can do it with just like through all shits, and we've done that sort of stuff at classes here before. But yeah, any questions on this specific setup of cameras and video processors? All right, let's hop over to the next station. <clears throat> so this one here, we shoot it like this. So we're going to notice something about this setup right off the bat. And let's come in a little tighter. Emma, operate that. Mm -hmm. Jonathan on the camera. Nick, you, Nick, you got to watch out. Get over the pipe, I would say, if you want to get their hands and stuff. Yeah. There. 
Are we losing signal? We are losing signal. That's I, the first thing I wanted to mention. Yeah. So we're losing the signal here. Um, and we didn't really mess up with anything else other than the uh, uh, just adding this video processor. Nicholas, you want to come in here and let's get the faceplate. So this is a real beautiful piece of 80s. Radio Shack, Radio Shack quality tech. <laughs> Radio Shack knowledge quality tech. Um, check out those big juicy potentiometers, ridged and notched. You got some large switches. Uh, pretty simple piece of equipment. Um, uh, but yeah, just hooking that into the video signal. So we're supposed to be enhancing it. All this does is high pass filter and noise reduction. That's VNR is video noise reduction. Uh, now look at the screen. <laughs> does it really look like we've enhanced the signal? <laughs> no. No, it looks fucking noise. Yeah, it looks noisy as shit. Um, interesting thing. So Emma mentioned before when you're doing like digital color correction, digital image processing, mm -hmm. you can use sharpening, you can use filters and stuff to bring out the grain. Mm -hmm. You're kind of a little stuck with uh, when you're doing analog video stuff, you're, uh, everything you do to sharpen and enhance the image is going to increase noise, which is why they put that little noise reduction mm -hmm. filter, which is 90% sure is just a lag filter in there. Um, but. Now we got a real sweet spot right here. Hold it here. What do we notice that's different about this setup from how we had it before? It's so jiggly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's quite bouncy, right? We've got a pentagon happening. We've got some geometry. I feel like I remember that there were worms before, but that I do feel like they are more defined. And it almost looks like, I mean, obviously it's like, just a trick of the video, but it almost looks like they're, I mean, just more defined, there's like almost like shading on them, it seems, like shadows kind of. Yeah, there's this weird drop shadow effect here. Yeah. That's that's an artifacting of high pass filters, is you get the, 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 the feeling of depth. You get a little bit of sort of like drop shadow happening as an artifacting of the filtering. And yeah, we also lose a lot of this color. Uh, Jonathan, can you defocus the camera? So that's the farthest one out. But we can still get some blobs happening in there, but we lose things. So yeah, play around with that focus a bit and see what kind of happens at different focuses. So it's a little harder to get color going on, although we are getting some high frequency color ringing banding in here. Um, and if we defocus enough, that high frequency color uh, ringing is going to turn into bring in some more light and we'll get some more color happening mm. as we open up the iris. Mm. But yeah, what do you notice about this setup, Elaine? Well, I mean, as you said, I mean, we lost the colors a little bit. I mean, because it was really colorful without the processor. So, I mean, I'm trying to understand like what changed like since we plugged in the processor. I was wondering if we played with saturation, that might help. Um, yeah, this one we don't get any saturation control, okay. so we can only mess around with what's going on on the, the, the camera itself. Although we're getting some, we got some right now. Yeah. It's a little bit more static though. But yeah, feel land, you want to move the um, monitor around a little bit? Try adjusting it. We're getting some interesting, does everyone notice like the little kind of like color noise that seems to happen mm -hmm. on the edges there? You can see that. Can you see that on the camera? A little bit. Be hard to, you know, tell if it's just that or the moiré <laughs> of the camera itself. Which sensor is artifacting here? <laughs> uh, uh, but does anyone have a guess as to what's going on there? Has anyone ever noticed that kind of like, if you've watched a video before and you see some sort of like, high, um, like some sort of black and white grid, and you see weird little like rainbow artifacting mm -hmm. on that? You've seen that before? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think's going on? Well, I guess, <laughs> I mean, I guess <laughs> to my understanding of how color works in video, it's like the, the 
colors are, are present already. Is that true? Um, and so I think that probably as part of the artifacting that like, because it's light and it's like trying to process like the white stuff again and again, that then instead of white, we end up with kind of changing colors, but I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit of that. So um, I think what you're trying to say is like, so we're sort of like averaging out. Yes. There's like the white and then there's black. black. Yeah. And <laughs> what's the average between white and black? You'd say gray, right? Yeah. Not in analog video. Yes. The average between white and black is something else because some really fucking weird things that have to do with how the video signal is encoded itself. So there's part of that, and there's also part of, you know, I was talking earlier, high frequency video signal is like that. Once you get to a certain high frequency, that high frequency information stops getting interpreted as black and white information and starts getting interpreted as color. Because mm -hmm. the color is at a very, very high frequency, modulated onto the brightness. So if you have a black and white grid pattern that is dense enough, it stops being recognized as lumin luminance and starts being interpreted as chromance. Mm -hmm. So pretty cool stuff. It's fun thing to like sort of intentionally play with that. If you have a digital system that you're running into analog, you can create a lot of weird color shit by just making... Um, uh, 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 these very dense, rigid, black and white moiré patterns. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too because it's like I'm manipulating the enhance um, setting on the video processor now mm -hmm. and like the less enhanced it is, which I think is kind of like the less definition, it's more colorful. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then it gets way less colorful when it artificially kind of creates um, the enhancement. Yeah, let's turn up the noise too. So let's take that VNR and turn it down. Wow, that's grungy as shit. <laughs> let's look in here a little bit. Everyone can see this right mm -hmm. here. What do you think is going on in there? Where's all that sort of like, it's not just, it's not straight noise. So noise is just noise. Like it would just be like, you know, like, like if we, had an old television that was had hooked up to an antenna and we took it to a turned it to a station that didn't exist which is i guess all of them nowadays um you would see noise but this is not actual noise noise there's color in there mm -hmm. looks like there's a pattern in there anyone have a guess on what's going on there this is some real obscure shit. well we took like this is the noise or the this, is this like isn't a, the source of noise. But the, this v is doing, the VNR is... The like, VNR is able to reduce noise, mm -hmm. but when we crank the sound, or we crank the sharpen up, we're enhancing every part of the signal, mm -hmm. even the weird sort of artifacts that might have to do with the sensor itself. Mm -hmm. So it's also, this is an interesting thing about how feedback works in general, is you're able to like, honestly find out these weird secret things that are happening in the background of how camera sensors work that mm -hmm. you otherwise wouldn't really be able to notice. This is, what we're seeing there is called a bay, buyer grid. And this camera right here, the little security camera, um, has a CMOS sensor and it's got this grid of transistors and each one of those transistors doesn't, so each one that maps to like one pixel on your output image here. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one where each transistor processes red, green, and blue. It's one transistor processes red, the next one green, the next one blue, the next one green, the next one red, the next one blue. So it's this weird uh, uh, grid called a buyer grid where it's doing discrete colors in like this way that if you look at it large enough, you're able to say, oh, that looks like uh, actual colors there. Um, but on a tiny processing scale, it's only processing one color at a time. And when we run it through a feedback loop and we enhance it, we're going to see the amplification of this. Sure. So that's a really nice, useful thing about using these old CMOS uh, uh, security cameras for video feedback, is they come built in with all this nasty, noisy artifacting, which no one would ever want to use to like shoot video like this, like y'alls are doing, but is really, really good for this because having that noise in there is what makes the video feedback cool. 
Cool. And yeah, one final thing we should talk about with the video processors is so that lock knob. Let's start messing around with lock. Oh, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, lean into that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do we think is happening here? We're, 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 how do you describe this sort of effect? This is not a desired enhancing. This is not making the video signal better. Is it about sync? Yeah, yeah, we're losing synchronization. Does anyone know what synchronization is? I mean, you've got a guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, it's uh, basically being created as part of a, um, a raster signal. So you have the, the, the signal darting across the screen at a, at a speed way higher than our ability to see. Um, but the thing is, the camera is taking in one signal and then sending it out, and both machines have to have the, the same rough sync in order for it to look like a visible picture mm. for us individually. So by taking away the vertical hold, is it the vertical hold? Yeah, when we go like yeah. that. When you take away that hold, then the, the picture, um, essentially the beginning spot on where the, the, uh, the, the image happens changes, and so it can do all sorts of weird shuttery type stuff. Yeah, 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 that's exactly what's going on, is we're losing the part of the signal that tells us where the frame starts and ends. Right. The, the CRT doesn't want to give up. It's like, I still feel the signal going through me, I want to do something, let me do my best, but it's kind of like, uh, there's something wrong about this, how can I just, just spit it out? And it gives up this sort of scrolling feeling. So basically it's trying to realign the signal with its monitor. It's doing its damnest. <laughs> But why is uh, this high-pass filter that we're running a video signal through removing sync information? Why is the geometry getting messed up here? Why, why is it a, a, a thing that this enhancer can do? Yeah, 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 this enhancer did it. It was, it was working fine before. I think presumably if you didn't have sync that you could use this to fix sync? Not quite. Okay. So we're not able to use video processors to control sync at all, except in the, this very sort of right. <laughs> grungy way of removing it. Yeah. So what we're doing is we've got the video signal, and it's got a bunch of luminance information that's continuously varying waves. We've got chrominance information that's very fast, continuously varying waves encoded within the luminance. Uh, we also have to know these sync signals. We have to know where do we put every pixel? Where does it all go? And these are analog, well, they're digital pulses within the analog uh, signal. that are just sort of like, it's a little kit that says, start over here, start a new frame here. Get to the end of here, start over, draw another line here. So we've got these little pulses in there. And if we filter those pulses, you take a pulse, mm and you run a high-pass filter on it, we're going to lose those edges. You're going to get something which is no longer has the, 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 the right shape for this to interpret as a, a, a kick to like start over a new frame. So this sort of... Oh. Yeah, I mean, I was just wondering if... I mean, because this uh, desynchronization, it also happens on the LCD here. So mm -hmm. that's not something specific to analog. No, no, no. It's every every monitor has to have some sort of idea of like where does the X and the Y go. With digital signals, it's a lot easier. If everything's pure digital, because everything can kind of be separated more discreetly. With an analog signal, we have to fit everything through this tube. It's imagining how would you take an image, chop it up, and feed it through a tube. You have to like separate everything and sort of like encode it all into one thing and like feed it through at the right rate. Um, so it's sort of a miracle it works even at all. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, but, but there's only so much we can do to a video signal with a video processor before we start to realize that we need to think about sync. We need to get serious and think about sync. And that's what brings us to video mixers. So we had sync issues. Uh, and that brings us to the subject of how do we deal with, we want to fuck up our video signal, we want to do some weird stuff to it, we don't have to worry about, we lose horizontal sync, we lose vertical sync, things are scrolling up and down. 
Uh, and that brings us to why we want video mixers. Video mixers are good not just for mixing video, uh, but because a video mixer has to have more advanced methods of dealing with synchronization than any old regular little video enhancer or video processor or anything like that. Because if you think about it, if we want to mix two video signals together, knowing what we know now about how does the geometry work, how does the synchronization work, no two video signals are going to be synced on their own. They're always going to have like their own independently generated synchronization. Meaning that if we just try to like, if you just take two video signals, plug them into a breadboard, stick a potentiometer in the middle, and mix between them, you're going to get some grungy ass like glitch shit. You're not going to get like a real video mix. You're going to get this gnarly thing that happens when you feed too many mix signals at the wrong frequencies in together. Um, what a video mixer does is take apart the video signal, uh, reduce it into like useful color information that it can do things on, and then reconstruct the video signal at the end of all of that processing stuff, along with another mixed video signal, if we've got two video signals in there, um, and build up a new set of synchronization information for the video signal. A side effect of that is if you zoom in on the feedback here, you can see that if you just take the output of a video mixer and plug it back into its input, we have video feedback. So much the same way that you just point a camera at a monitor, you get video feedback. If you plug the output of a mixer back into its input, you get video feedback. And um, this stage of things, at this part of the workshop, we sort of lose the ability to make generalizations because other than you have a video mixer, you have this T-bar, and you can mix between two channels. You're going to have special effects, you're going to have different white patterns, but there's just not too many standards about how everything is going to work. Every independent company that made video mixers, and even the same company that made different models of video mixers, kind of labels things differently, has slightly different techniques for layout, and they process the signal in different ways. So they're all going to have slightly different kinds of feedback happening, but it's mostly going to look like this kind of thing where it's maybe like blobby green, blobby magenta, and blobby red, maybe a little bit of blue, sort of like moving usually from left to right or from this corner down to the bottom corner. Um, yeah, so what, to, uh, what do you notice about mixer feedback that's sort of different from video feedback right away? Well, what I'm... Um definitely interested in is just that we don't have an external source for that feedback anymore so it's just this connection to well the environment i guess so that's interesting because that's like video generating itself from itself i guess yeah yeah a little bit of artificial life yeah a bit here. <laughs> yeah. jonathan you played with video feedback mixer feedback before. oh yeah i love it what's what's so <clears throat> what what sort of separates that from doing the camera stuff in your practice well, I mean, it, it, it's really fascinating to me because, like, to a certain extent, the video mixers that I've played with are black boxes. Like, essentially, you're taking a signal, you're feeding it back into itself, and whether or not you're using a composite signal or using, um, like, a, a, an S-video signal, like, those two things are going to be slightly different because however this thing is built from the get-go, it takes a signal that's really trying to make sense of itself as well. So it's fascinating to me because this is essentially giving it a signal and asking it to make something out of it. And rather than like modern machines and modern LCDs that just give you a blue buffer screen, like this is really truly making an effort to do whatever it can with the signal you've got. And I think that really comes back to the idea of like, this is great as a, as a time-based corrector, as a video sync like machine, because again, it's going to do absolutely everything it can to do what, it, like, what it's able to with this. And the really fun thing to me about the video mixers is that it's got all these additional like random effects that they thought would be cool to put in at some point. And then when you start adding in all of these things on top of it, you're really modifying in really, really strange ways. And just the textures that come out of it are just utterly fabulous. And the colors are wonderful too. Um, yeah, speaking yeah. of special effects, Hunter, do you want to start walking us through, this is a Panasonic MX50, 
Many <laughs> people say this is their favorite one of the video mixers to use. Uh, 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 I think they're a little man, over, over the top, but they're pretty cool. Um, they're really kind of not great for these introductory classes just because like my goal for these classes is to make sure people can't fail easily all the time. <laughs> This is a bad mixer for that. You can fail very easily on this mixer all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but Hunter, do you want to walk us through some of the special effects you can do on this? Yes. Some wipes. Um, we have different wipe patterns all over here. And you can just tap through them and get different shapes. And... Yes, we got diamond wipe. We got circle wipe. Uh, what's happening? So. Uh, uh, we've got two signals here. We actually we have one signal and two channels. So another nice thing you can do with the video mixer, you can only plug one video signal into it and you can process it through two different channels in different ways. So same channel or same video signal, different channels, and we have a black in, or no, a full uh, color invert happening on the other channel. So you get this crazy strobing effect, very similar to the thing that we had with the, the first camera feedback where we had an inverted uh, 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 color thing going on. Um, the different white patterns, do you want to do some more yeah. wiping and I'll talk about it? So as we do this wiping, you can kind of see that we're able to use the edges of the white patterns to sort of constrain and uh, give more form texture outline to the video feedback. So this is a little bit of, we don't have a camera here that we can just steer, move around, point out, point down, zoom in, zoom out, but we do have these controls on the mixer in order to like give shape and sort of steer things in a direction. Um, other things we can do with this is, um, do you want to play around with that sample and hold? Let's do a strobe on one of the channels. And then see as we mix, it's sampling and holding the, 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 the signal. It's usually called strobe on the video mixers. You've probably seen this on music videos from the late 80s or early 90s. <laughs> uh, but this effect works really nice with the feedback because you know, as when we first turned it on, it was strobing really fast and kind of shaky and herky-jerky. And we can the time on it. slow it down, take our time, enjoy and luxuriate in the feedback as it uh, uh, iterates frame by frame. Um, what else? What other effects do you like on here, Hunter? Um, let's see, let's see. Mono gets like a posterized kind of paint. Um, yeah, posterize. Uh, 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 I'm never really sure if you pronounce it posterize or posterize. Um, it is quantifying the color space, stepping it off. So uh, when we do this feedback sort of stuff, restricting the color space like that gives it another level of sort of like, uh, uh, sort of like, I don't know if this is a relatable thing, uh, but if you had a dirt road growing up, and there was a lot of rain and there was just like a lot of puddles everywhere. You play around with the puddles and you take sticks and sort of like make shapes for the water to flow in. It's kind of like that's how I think of it. Or like putting rocks around, uh, rearranging rocks in a pond to like create different sounds and shapes in the water. That's how I like to think about posterization or posterization. Um, but of course, another thing we can do with this is mix. So we have a VHS here, which I think is playing, and we can switch one of the channels on here to uh, uh, bring in the uh, VHS signal. So yeah, we, have, <laughs> we have a mosaic. Um, so right, actually. <laughs> and so yeah, that video right. signal is grunge the heck up with a yes. lot of effects right now. Yes. <laughs> here we go, clean signal. So yeah. Come in here, this is gonna get us, uh, uh, this is gonna get me flagged on the YouTube channel again. <laughs> Probably not. Um, as long as we don't have the audio playing. I had this issue once where I was like shooting at my parents' house and I had like nephews and nieces over and they were watching like Herbie the Love Bug in another room. 
and then I was trying to do some shoots for something, and it had the audio from Herbie in it, and anything I tried to upload from it was like, Disney says you can't use this. Who you wow. remove this audio? I'm just like, what the fucking Herbie? Mm-hmm. Seriously? Um, but yeah, so we can do this linear fade. Hunter is doing usually what's what's just called mixing. Uh, technically, we call this linear fade. So linear fade from a VHS signal to feedback, and we get that trailing effect going on. Uh, does this remind you of anything? Anything y'all have seen before in culture? Uh, Beastie Boys sense? music videos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone ever seen stuff like this before? Uh, knock on Wood music video. <laughs> um, a lot of music videos. So many music videos. <laughs> yeah, a lot of music videos in public access. <laughs> um, Psychic TV also did a lot of shit like that. Yeah, yeah. Psychic TV had a lot of video art. CTI, the other side of the post-Robin Griswold world, uh, they they were heavily involved in video art, video feedback stuff in the 80s. Put out a lot of VHSs with like uh, a lot of jams. Um, but yeah, what other ways can we mix video with this? So, other ways we can mix video? Uh, Besides wipes and fades? A key. Yeah, yeah, we can luma key. Ah, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone understand? Everyone's heard about luma keying before, right? Or green screening is usually yeah. what people call it, colloquially. Uh, but luma keying, what does luma keying mean? Uh, okay, so. Okay, I'm gonna have the French word for this now. <laughs> okay, okay, it's like when you cast an image into another, but you just, uh, um, I mean, not another, but it's just like, for example, you're gonna decide, like in the green, you're gonna put another image. It's like the green or the blue usually. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's chroma keying, or what people call green screening. So we are able to somehow detect there is this color right here in one frame, and we're gonna remove all of that color and replace it with whatever's in the next frame. Uh, luma keying is a little older than chroma keying. If you have to guess based on the name, what would luma keying mean? Something with light. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and brightness. Yeah, we use the brightness. So even simpler than chroma keying, we can just use brightness information. Nicholas, are you on the, the, you can see that? So let's bring up luma keying a little bit and you can see we're starting from the darkest part of the video. Mm-hmm. We're removing that and we're replacing that with um, the feedback. So this, on this side. These poor characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're having fun. <laughs> they're, you know, have you ever melted like this before? It's a pretty good time. <laughs> um, should we, we switch the layers A and B? No, keep it this way for now. Um, and then uh, uh, a fun thing you can do with this kind of setup, um, if we strobe, turn the sample and hold on channel A, and turn it up a bit, you can actually see sort of like what I was talking about earlier, where we like can see the sort of copies echo. You can see how each copy degrades with every single frame. Little chaotic. Uh, 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 um, you can see it there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if we also go to turn off stroke there and then just turn it on here, and we do a little bit of this, and then you can see frame by frame, it's going to crank up the green, crank up the magenta. NTSC color loves blue, magenta, and red so much more than any other color. Try to get Try to get like a yellow in there somewhere. It's really hard <laughs> without some digital shit going on. Um, yeah, I'm just do a quick white back like that. Then there we go. You can see it grades the brightness every time and turns everything that was desaturated saturates it up. So that's sort of like a frame by frame of how do we blob up our video. <laughs> that looks like the effects back used for the background at the beginning. I mean, it was probably the keying as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts, comments, questions, suggestions, hopes about video mixers? I mean, how many um, souls can you add with a mixer? <clears throat> that's a great question. So almost every single video mixer that you will ever find in the world 
you could plug as many as like 16 sources into it, but you can usually only mix two sources together at once. Some of them, Nicholas, if you shoot over here, so this would be one of the last eras of like um, SD video mixers. This is a Grass Valley Indigo. This one, you can see you've got 10 sources you can choose from, and you can sort of mix between three sources. Uh, but first, look at this and compare it to this one. This was made like 15 years after that was manufactured. So you can sort of, and just from the general strain in my voice, which I am amplifying in order to communicate that that is a heavy device. <laughs> um, it's just, you've got to have so much more to mix more than two sources. So pretty much every video mixer you'll ever encounter, maybe you can plug as many as four or eight sources in, you can only mix two. Ooh. So you got to keep stacking up. And that's how they would work in a broadcast studio, is you'd have like a shelf rack like that, you'd have mixer, 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 you'd have a big sink generator at the top, you'd have different rack units for every, almost every single thing, like um, in terms of generating titles, doing like color processing shit. Um, but yeah, great question. So you need like a couple of different uh, mixers to be able to mix more than two sources? No, yeah, you'll yeah, never yeah. be able Even to mix We need more. two mixers to mix three sources. You, you can, oh, wow. Instead but of making you... like a little tunnel mm -hmm. with all the wipes, you can just do Luma key or Chroma key mm -hmm. over each other and have them poke out at different points. Okay, so we're going to have like a huge feedback loop between like different mixers yeah. and stuff? Yeah, yeah, we've done that here before okay. a bunch That's of true. times. Mm -hmm. okay. Mixer, mixer. We do, yeah, we do little mixers. parties where we, for the holidays, we plug all our mixers into one another so they can get to know each other and catch up, <laughs> see what's happened over the year. Uh, yeah. What should people look for when they're getting a video mixer? That's a great question. So, in terms of usability, um, things that are worth talking about, I'm going to have you move with me and you can just hang out there for a second. So you get a good shot of this. This is what we call a what you see is what you get interface. You can see all the controls right there, you can just touch things, you've got some potentiometers, you can do continuous controls with, everything's right there. There's not really that much sort of like digital information. If you follow me back here, you can see on the other hand we have a different kind of video mixer that has a very minimal interface. It's really lightweight, it's nice, small, compact. This is not really made for broadcast quality stuff. This is made for live VJ performances, although the number one consumer of these over the years was churches, so. <laughs> uh, but this one, you need to have a separate monitor in order to do anything interesting because it's got digital menus for everything. It's got all this sort of stuff you can jump in and out of. So the big thing I try to communicate to people about mixers is you can either have a mixer that is fairly easy and intuitive to use from the get-go, like that one. Or you can have a mixer that has tons of extra special effects and a lot more things loaded in it, but is a little more kind of a pain in the ass to like work with and set up. So those are two big things to look for. Uh, something else worth noticing is you've got different kinds of connectors. This one just uses a standard kind of what you find on the back of your televisions. Um, yellow RCA cables. And if we scooch back on over here, you can see that this one has these connectors that always throw people for a loop when they first get into that. It's called a BNC connector. And that's just a different kind of termination. Broadcast quality stuff uses that because you can't just trip on the, the cable and yank it out. It's got a little thing that locks in it. Uh, but the thing to note is that it's not a different cable, it's not a different signal, same thing. Um, you just, you can use these little, yeah, yeah, you can use these little kind of, um, I don't know, nuggets, what do you call them? Adapters. Modules, adapters, in order to um, convert like your RCA. And they go to reverse. Emergency. Yeah, the other way around. And, you can to make little jewelry, jewelry. Oh. you can take them and put them in a big chain together and just make like a nice large link. Yeah, great questions. Uh, any other questions about mixers? 
like I said, it's kind of frustrating to sort of cram everything about mixers into like a short thing, because you can't. You've seen any other videos I've made about video mixers where I go into details on them. It's like a couple hours long, and that's only slightly because I'm pathological. It's also because there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> and, and like there's no real standardization, but on the whole, I tend to sort of see ones that either have four inputs or two inputs, have uh, a chroma key or a luma key, or don't have a chroma key or a luma key. Those are the big sort of yeah. things I've noticed. Let's go take a look at this one real briefly is this is sort of it's also made by panasonic like the big one they had earlier but this one is more like sort of excuse me public access like um it doesn't have bnc connectors this is not fully up to like broadcast standards and you can't see it on here but i'm just going to tell you we don't really have luma key we don't really have a real proper luma key or chroma key on here just wipes um on the other hand it's also pretty lightweight it's very easy to use, very hard to go wrong with these ones. Um, probably this for most folks, if you're like slightly concerned about like confusion and like having trouble operating things, smaller and simply the better. Because you can still do a lot with the, 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 the smaller mixers. But yeah, I think that might be just about it. Mm -hmm. The video mixer section, everyone good on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up for this contrived fake session of Introduction to Analog Signals. Um, we don't really have a super like cataloged way to finish these up because, to be quite honest, they end in a lot of different ways. A lot of times there's just like people get fucking hypnotized and they're just like drawn in and you actually kind of have to like be like, hey, you have to go, you have to leave now. <laughs> uh, and then sometimes people are just like, okay, whatever, um, it's 8.45, I'm gonna go home now. So um, it always, it's just kind of like, it, 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 we just go with the flow and see what people are feeling. Um, but probably an ideal way to end this sort of thing uh, would be to get together again in a little round robin like we're doing right now. And we'll just sort of talk about like, so what did we, like, like not necessarily what did we learn, but how do we sort of see ourselves using this information? Whatever information we have gained, and everyone has gained information from this, even though everyone sort of learned about this one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And how can we, how do we want to use this information for the future, for art stuff, for performance stuff, or just to be weird and stay up all night and look at my TV stuff? Like, <laughs> any answer is good. Um, so I'll start off with, me, personally, what I take away from these kind of things, the classes that I organize, the classes that I put together, is one, I learn things about processes that I don't know otherwise. Uh, people teach me things all the time. It's such a stupid cliche to say, but it's a cliche and it's trite because it's actually true. If you teach people stuff, they will teach you things as long as you're willing to listen and like respond to them. The other thing is that every time we do this kind of stuff, every time, even just the setting up and the tearing down from this, like, I get better at it. I get better at this whole process. Um, and that makes my whole, like, artistic zones that much more, like, easy to work with because I just do this all the time. It makes it hard for me to fuck up what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, that's what I take away from these things. Um, you know, I, I still learn stuff all the time. Uh, there's all sorts of limit things that you, you only sort of get at because you never would have approached it that way. Working with other people in the class is something, you know, I get stuff out of, um, and, uh, having the chance to experiment with all these different flavors and methodically go through it, developing sort of a palette for yourself. I'm constantly reminded that as many times as you add mixers and enhancers and cameras together, that every single combination is different. And this is always just exciting for me to, to be reminded of that. And I don't know, I want to kind of dive into slapping some more things together and seeing what comes up. Well, it's a little like you. I mean, like, okay, I don't do practice, I do research, but like I'm living at least today thinking about all... Oh, um, 
the sources that actually come in that feedback loop. So it's not just the camera and the monitor, but you have the sensors of the camera, and then you have the mixers and blah, 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 and you can get glitches everywhere. And since I'm ready into like the idea of like video agency, for example, I like the idea that all these artifacts are, I don't know. I mean, I think they're really important. I would, I would want to understand better still, like maybe practice more tomorrow, but how they play into these feedback loops and get this like amazing pattern that look like life of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, uh, for me, working with them, the processors and mixers and all these feedback systems, uh, it can be very confusing, but I think, I feel like every time that, you know, I come back and like, I'm, I work on it, or I see Andre or someone else work on it. I learn more, um, or like it becomes more familiar, and I get more used to it. So, um, yeah, I, I think uh, I just want to keep coming back and keep seeing like what else can be done with these images that we make and how we can manipulate them. Um, yeah, it's just cooler every time. Yeah, you know. Grabbing the, uh, the camera set on up. Swap, swap, swap! You're well, on camera now. Let's and now directly <laughs> staring to the camera. Um, why do I... I feel like I think a lot about, or I like to think about like the principles of it as like a, a play thing and not as like a, of a set art. I feel like I kind of mentioned that before that like coming from a live performance background that like I don't know, I feel like I've been here a lot of times and I get frustrated because like what I want to happen isn't happening. But then like everyone has said, like every time you do it, you get a little faster and better at it. And then also like understanding that even in something so technical, like it's really about like the interaction with it. It's not a really about the end product. I feel like the video signals class is really like important for establishing that and gives you all the stuff that like all the potential stuff that you might be using. <laughs> And then you can kind of be like, wait, I'm here to like explore the things, not to like create one image. Cause that's kind of like counterintuitive to what it is. And then that's a beautiful sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, but yeah. And then, like I said, at the beginning of this, the main goal of this is not to teach you or to give you an experience that is isomorphic to taking this actual class. This is a contrived scenario. We set everything up, uh, and you, most importantly, you didn't get to touch or put your hands on anything. The most important thing about how to learn how to do this stuff is you have to be able to interact with it in real time with other people, ideally. Um, and what I would like for most of the people who see this video to do, and if you have access to any video gear whatsoever, is to do something like this on your own. Like, it doesn't have to be formal, it doesn't have to be hard. If you scan around here, you see we're not really working in, like, some sort of, like, real crazy studio space here. This is just literally a crumbling basement with basically a dirt floor that we put fucking AstroTurf on. Um, and we're just sort of like, this is a space we have to work with, and this is how we do things. You can just do DIY classes, and you don't actually even have to know that much. The only important thing to know is to like know enough how to like make sure nobody fails really bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that about sums it up. What was that thing I said about think? Think about sync? <laughs> <laughs> if I had thought this out better, we'd have like some sort of like really clever, catchy rhyme to end out with. We'll just go back to that. Think about sync. That's what it's really sync, all think. about. Sync, 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 sync into the thinks of your thoughts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> loose, loose think sinks. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Alright. High <laughs> five. <laughs> we did that! Uh, uh,